It's Conduit News Radio with Paul Harrell. A part of that is to let you listen to uh, your legislators. Um, and uh, we're going to do that now. Welcome back to the program. We've got Senator Kim Hammer is uh, back with us. Uh, Kim, how are you this morning? It's a beautiful morning, Paul. No rain, sun is shining. It is a beautiful morning. It is. It certainly is. Um, and it has been pretty wet uh, over the last uh, week or so. Um, so, uh, Senator Hammer, we do these... Uh, you know, little segments called the impression of the session every two years after you guys wrap up a, a general assembly. And so just the, the first question is generally, Senator Kim Hammer, what was your impression of the session 2019? Oh, well, it was pretty good. I mean, you win some, lose some, uh, some things got through, whether or not had seen, you know, get through and then some uh, things that uh, need to get through, did get through. So it's, you know, when you're judging a session, you kind of take it by the law of averages and remember that you've always got the next time to come around and try to undo what was bad and try to get through what was good but didn't get through this time. So I try to look at it as a long game and not just a one and done kind of deal. But, yeah. You know, overall, it, you know, overall it was it was pretty good. Gained some ground, you know, in some key areas and uh, gave up some ground in some key areas too. So I'm just well, overall that's always my attitude about it. Well, so feel free, you know, feel free to talk about the ground that uh, you think we gained and the ground that we lost, or or do you like to divide it into maybe like, well, this are the social issues, you know, this is how we did here, this is how we did on the economic issues. Feel free, tell us what you think. On the social issues, I think we, you know, I think we did pretty good. Uh, the one thing that was amazing this time that I hadn't seen before, don't expect it to get any better as time rocks along. Um, is we saw some of the uh, Washington-style uh, liberal Democrat machine, you know, cranked up and running pretty good when it came to the social issues this time, um, and you know the uh, uh, when it when it came to the pro-life issues and everything, uh, some of the people you would have expected to uh, get entrenched one side of the issue did. I was just uh, a little bit more amazed by the liberal side that they got as entrenched, and even more so than they did. So. I think there's every time we meet, uh, every time people are elected, you're starting to see that that divide of the obvious liberal left uh, from the obvious conservative right. I think that gulf is widening uh, yeah. on the social issue. So felt good about the uh, pro-life bills that you know got through. Uh, felt you know good about the Second Amendment rights that got through. Um, although I know Bob had to send his into interim study, and, and that's okay. That's Kind of like what I was talking about a while ago, you, you know, you want to run a marathon, not necessarily sprint all the time. And so you'll have a couple of years to uh, massage that out. Um, I know Flippo got the Senator Flippo got the uh, resolution through kind of helping clear up the judge's yes. determination about, you know, the open carry. So mm -hmm. that was good. That'll be tested probably at some point. Probably have to come back and actually pass a law that defines it a little better. Uh, I was a little bit disappointed in some of the free speech bills, which I, I ran some of those that we weren't able to get some of those through. Um, those are going to go into interim study and we'll talk it out over the next year and a half. Kind of, kind of refresh the, the listener on that. What was the issue at hand? I know you were trying to expand FOIA uh, to, to, to college foundations. Is that correct? That was one of them. Now, um, I, I filed a bill and Bob Ballinger filed a bill on campus free speech. Um, and we combined our efforts together. Uh, the one I had was a little more stringent, uh, but the one that he had was a little bit more doable. So we combined the two together uh, and worked uh, well with uh, some outside resources. Uh, Robert Steinbeck was one of the outside resources yes. we worked with to uh, get that shape and molded. And, uh, and then there were some, op you know, some groups outside the state that were working on that. So. Yeah, we felt like that was a, a victory. I think it's like anything else in that area. you got to just keep chipping away until you get where it needs to be. But we certainly made a big step in that. On the uh, FOIA, on the uh, foundations, what I was trying to do is make the uh, college foundations more transparent and accessible as far as uh, the funds, how they, uh, how they disperse them. wasn't so much going after the donors um, as much as I was, uh, how that sometimes they like to, step across the line as far as uh, dealing with governmental policy, but yet they want to go back and hide behind their 
nonprofit shield and uh, not have you know FOI accessibility. Uh, and I think as long as higher ed continues to come and ask us for more money, uh, those foundations then um, you know should be looked at uh, to determine what they're doing with all the money that they're getting. Uh, so we can see if we can start cut back as a state as far as funding higher ed and, and let it become more uh, some funding you know coming from the foundations. Wow, perhaps. yeah, actually that'd be a great that, that's a great idea, and and I, I can see the end game. I can see what you mean about it being a marathon on that on that front because um, you know it would be nice to say again you don't want to you don't want to see donors you just want to see hey you know how much how much money are we talking about here and can we better uh, can we save taxpayer money if if you guys don't need as much. So that's actually really good looking out for the taxpayer. That's the name of the game. So <laughs> as much as as much as we can. So, so so can we we're talking with Senator Kim Hammer's impression of the session. Can we talk about economic issues for a second? Do you think the people of Arkansas in the next fiscal year are gonna end up paying more money as a net tax increase to the government than they uh, than they are now? Well we keep um, there there's actually a running chart on that. I'm going to be up to Capitol this week and going to get the updated version of it. I'll be glad to share it with you. I think if all the taxes that, um, you know, were successful this time around get out there and you apply the tax credits, I think it's going to end up, and I'm looking at the 100,000 foot level as far as how it affects each individual uh, class or taxpayer, you know, it, it, there might be, there probably will be winners and losers. But when you look at the overall money out, um, I think you're going to see that the that the increases were there, uh, you know, more taxes being collected than than being returned. Yeah, um, I get that chart. I'll be glad to share that with you. But there was a there was kind of a running tally that was being kept during the session. Well, uh, I, I just don't have that in front of me right I, now. Yeah, I would love to. I, I've I've got some numbers too. Just just DFNA's numbers, and, and you know, even their numbers are showing uh, are showing that fiscal year 2020, 2021 more money coming from the people. Uh, Senator Hammer, you voted against uh, two of these bills that were, uh, you know, I think big money takers from the people to the government uh, to provide additional revenue for the maintenance and repair of highway streets and bridges. This was the, the gas tax increase, uh, no vote there, as well as uh, HJR 1018 to continue the levy of the one half percent sales tax that's set to sunset. You voted against that as well. So tell me, why did you vote against those two measures? Uh, a couple things factored into that. One was, um, at the same time, we were passing those two tax bills. We were trying to pass two bills that were intended to hold the highway department more accountable for how they manage construction projects and basically how they spent the money they got and have they done it wisely. I just thought it was a little bit, in fact, I think my comments on the floor was, uh, are we getting the cart before the horse here because we're going to pass these taxes as we pass these other two bills, which I think were indicators that, you know, we question how the highway department spends their money. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having to pass those bills. So why not just wait and let the, um, you know, let's pass these other two bills. Let's get the results in. Because here's the thing. If the tax doesn't pass, if the people don't pass the tax that's going to the ballot, we still have one more general session that will be back in session where we can vote on that tax as a legislative body and the people not have to vote on it uh, before the time runs out on the tax that currently is in place. So why not, you know, why not get those reports going? Let's see, you know, how they're doing as far as managing those construction projects. Are they being efficient with the citizens tax paying ta uh, tax money? And if they are, and if it shows that best practices are in place and we just have, you know, we have the need because our, state is growing numerically and increased traffic and all that stuff, then, hey, you know, that's that may be what we need to do. I just thought it was a little bit of a cart before the horse, yeah. given the fact that we're filing those two bills. And then you read the paper this morning, um, article in the paper this morning, and, you know, one of the commissioners questioned the uh, highway director, and, you know, is this your plan or is this the governor's plan? So I'd, I'm not sure there's even peace within the camp. Uh, at the highway department as far as the plan and how they're going to spend the money. And I know there's you got to talk through the process. I get it. Um, but, you know, if there's a spirit at the highway department that give us our money, we'll do our own thing. I, I got a little bit of problem with that. I think there needs to be a, a little bit better display Absolutely. of uh, uh, submission to the, you know, to the legislative branch, even though they're a constitutionally independent organization. Well, I will tell you this. 
Uh, you talk about a politically tough decision. If the people of Arkansas vote down the continued levy of this half cent sales tax that's set to sunset, and then you guys come back and pass it anyway, that's uh, well, that's 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 definitely a, a catch twenty two, I guess. <laughs> well, and and I think that what that kind of what forces what I'm doing with my time during the interim between now and the next, you know, before the people have to vote. We just went through this transformation. Um, you know, and, and there's a number of around 16 million that it's supposed to save. And, uh, Julie Mayberry was the house sponsor. She initiated the idea and I was the Senate sponsor following her lead about, you know, doing away with the gambling loss, yeah. uh, tax deduction, 10 million. I think what, what I'm focusing on over the next 12 months is how can we piece together from savings within the government? the 200 million so we don't have to ask the taxpayers for more money because the money is already there yeah we just have to put together the comprehensive plan which we didn't really have time to do during the session but now we've got this time to put that plan together and give people a choice as far as their their vote if they want to vote the tax in that's great but if there's money there to be saved um then go ahead and present that we, to them as maybe a reason to vote against because we've got this other plan well, I think that we ought to always be operating, you know, I think we need to operate government to the question of what's the most efficient way to do it. And then number two, what are essential services? Uh, I think that's the question we need to focus around. I'll be focused around over the next year. What yeah. exactly are essential services? Because if you identify essential services, then you justify your budget or can't justify your budget because it's not essential to what we should be doing as a government to the needs of the people of our state. Yeah. Um well, and real quick, you know, on, in Friday's paper, there was a report about the general revenue collections in April surged to a record, and it increased by $116 million. Uh, it exceeded the state's, uh, uh, it was like it was like $958 million, but it exceeded the state's forecast by $125 million. And I just thought to myself, Senator Hammer, you know, the, ha the, uh, the, the gas tax increase, the tax at the wholesale level, that was to raise $95 million. That We start collecting that in October. Your gas, gas taxes are going to go up. And all of a sudden, the state in April has $125 million that they didn't know they were going to have, that they that was above their forecast. And I'm thinking, well, there's your money right there, you know. Now, I know it's hindsight and it's 2020, but still, you know. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it may be hindsight or it may not be. It may be part of the overall plan because if you budget your forecast low, expecting it to come in high based on what the experts tell you as far as trending, you would naturally go in and budget it low, and then you have this surplus money, which the danger of surplus money is who spends it and how does it get spent and where does it go. Now, we have the long-term reserve fund that some of that is dedicated to, but, you know, my theory is if we capture that, and stop it from being spent on on programs, um, then you, you cut off the need to have to go back to the taxpayer and ask for more tax money because the strength, because the revenue is being driven by the economy. Of course, I also believe in seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. Yes. We need to be putting up seven years of plenty right now because in 08, we get the famine. And, uh, you know, that's one thing we did was uh, to the business world, uh, when it came to the unemployment tax, uh, thanks to the work of Department of Workforce Services, they came up with a, a sliding scale. So now employers you know, are projected to have to pay 40 to $60 million less into the unemployment uh, fund because right now we're in strong economic times and that money is being returned to the employers. So I, I think it's creative things like that that position us to not have to ask for tax money if we just take what's coming in during these strong economic times and spend it wisely. Mm. Um, yeah. There was a bill I tried to get through about making your money work harder. Our treasurer is one of the best treasuries in the nation, and there's money that's having to be parked outside of the treasury that's not getting the return on it, that if it was with mm -hmm. the treasury, uh, it could be earning significant money throughout the year. But the lobbying forces are strong in the capital, and, you know, that didn't happen. And, you know, hopefully we'll see that effort come back around because I, I think that if you if you don't work your own money as hard as you can why should you ask the taxpayer for more money when you're not doing the most with what you got mm, that sounds reasonable to me uh senator kim hammer it's always great to talk to you sir i appreciate 
again, those no votes on those tax increases. And uh, uh, thanks for coming on, giving your impression of the session, sir. Thank you, Paul. Have a good day. All right, you too. Folks, we're going to take a break. 870-275-9799. Sound off Facebook.com slash Conduit News. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's Conduit News. you got to subscribe and then click the little bell to receive notifications back in a moment.